Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. And this is part of the good stuff, actually the great stuff. And this is part of the AAS Journal Author Series. And I am super happy to have Aaron Leonard with us today. Hey, Aaron. Hi, how's it going? I am doing very awesome on this September 6th of 2022, the day after Labor Day in the U.S. Um, and I'm doing yep. sick. And how about you, Aaron? How are you doing? Good. Had a nice long weekend. Can't complain, except for the fact that we were all melting here in uh, the LA basin. <laughs> so that was super fun. Yes, yes. You yeah. guys are getting uh, quite the temperature and some fires as well. Yeah, some yeah. fires. Not, not too bad so far this season, but yeah, definitely some okay. fires. We were uh, up at 110 or so here in uh, Pasadena, Monrovia this weekend. Mm -hmm. So it was, I'm sure you're familiar. Right? That's a little toasty. Yeah, Phoenix yeah. 110 and... <laughs> <laughs> Um, for us it's really hot so yeah well it reminded me when i went to uh when i went to the double s meeting in pasadena back in june did you go to that one no i didn't no no uh the temperatures were up around 95 97 mm -hmm. and everyone was complaining how hot it was and I was, well, this is nice yeah <laughs> <Wonderful>. <laughs> yeah yeah i can imagine you still get that you still get that big moderation from the pacific ocean coming in so it's still although it's not, you still have that that freshness from the ocean that's still and so it's very cool yeah that is a pretty awesome background picture behind you there thank you i got miranda here with me today Indeed. Um, Indeed. help me talk about the iranian system it's oh. our frankenstein moon it's one of my favorites <laughs> ah, that wouldn't be interesting to know how that one was put together <laughs> exactly <laughs> and so speaking of um aaron what do you like to do for research uh, yeah, so mostly I study planetary surfaces. I'm a planetary geologist. Uh, I focus mostly in the outer solar system on icy satellites and potential ocean worlds, um, such as Europa, Enceladus, and Miranda, and Ariel. Um, so really all across the outer solar system. Very nice. Very nice. And that is going to bring us to this super awesome Planetary Science Journal article, PSJ. It's open access, people. You can go grab a copy. Go get one. Umami, a new Frontiers style mission concept to explore the Iranian system. And Aaron, take us away. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Well, first off, I have to thank all of my co-authors here. This was a big collaboration between myself and, and all the people you see listed here um, across institutions. Um, you know, this is a mission concept. It, and like I said, I, I mostly study icy satellite surfaces. So and then a lot of what, what we'll be talking about today is not icy satellite surfaces. So that's definitely where all my co-authors came in um, and, and pulled their weight for sure. Um, so thank you to them. And uh, we will hopefully do honor to their work here today. Good shout out. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this is our new frontier style mission concept to explore the Uranian system. We came up with this um, before the recent decadal survey. So in advance of the recent decadal survey, this was um, uh, something, this was a concept that we had come up with to write a white paper about because before the planetary science decadal survey, we weren't sure how the Uranian system or how Uranus was gonna fare, if it was going to be selected to potentially have a flagship or not. and so. We wanted to make sure there were a variety of options out there for exploring Uranus in the future. And so that's really where this came from, um, is to have a low cost option. Um, so that New Frontier style is around a $1 billion or so mission concept. And so that's really what we were aiming for. And what's unique about this one is that it's really focused on the Iranian system. So the moons, the magnetosphere, and the rings, as opposed to the, to the uh, planet itself, as opposed to Uranus itself. Um, and that's where its name comes from, Uranus Magnetosphere and Moon Investigator. Um, ah, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. Thank you. Or, or as I also like to say, a taste of the Uranian system. Just a, uh, yeah. <laughs> Just a taste. <laughs> Very cool. Um, yeah, so scrolling down here, um, we can get started by uh, looking at the moons, if you want, in figure one. Sure. And this is really what uh, drove our mission concept from the beginning, at least in my opinion, are just how mysterious these moons in the Iranian system are. So in, in, in A, we have actually Enceladus, which is a moon of the Saturnian system, but in B and C, we have Miranda and Ariel, respectively. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason we're comparing to Enceladus here um, in figure A is because you can, this is um, the image that Voyager took of Enceladus. So this is what mm -hmm. we knew when, when, we ha when we had just Voyager images of Enceladus, like what we have of the Uranian moons, just Voyager images. 
Um, and what we can see on Enceladus, or we see these heavily tectonized terrains as pointed out by the white arrows. They're relatively young. They don't have a lot of craters on them, but they're sharply juxtaposed right next to them. And that sharp boundary, we have crater terrain. So really old, heavily cratered terrains. And this is what we knew about Enceladus. After Voyager 2, we had these really dichotic terrains uh, right next to each other. And that's really what we see on Miranda as well in the Uranian system. We have, again, these really heavily tectonized terrains called Corona mm. uh, pointed out in the white arrows, Inverness Corona, the one that looks like an L uh, right there is, is what's pointed out in the white arrows and Elsinore mm -hmm. is on the right. Mm -hmm. And then we have these really, again, sharply juxtaposed, sharply juxtaposed by the crater terrains in the black mm -hmm. arrows really sharp boundaries. And that's something we don't see very often in, in the solar system. So mm -hmm. another interesting note, right, is that um, Enceladus and Miranda are approximately the same size. So it's really interesting when we think mm -hmm. about what we know about Enceladus now after Cassini, uh, we know Enceladus is super active and it has these geysers coming out of the south polar terrain um, and the tiger stripe fractures. And it really raises the question whether Miranda could be active as well in a very similar situation in the Uranus system. Mm -hmm. um, and then of course, uh, over here in figure C, we can't uh, show pictures of the Uranian moons without showing a picture of Ariel. It's just so enigmatic and interesting. Um, it's about twice the size of Miranda, so it's quite a bit bigger, um, that diameter of about a 1,200 kilometers or so. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we do see relatively um, these crater terrains over here on the left with the black arrows and oh. then the heavily tectonized terrains with these really smooth cosmata and these oh, like yeah. ridges and trough systems like what's going on on aerial mm -hmm. there's really no good analog for that in the solar system um, and so there's something really interesting going on on aerial as well and while all the uranian moons look really interesting here we point out specifically miranda and aerial they're the best image by voyager 2 miranda was imaged 250 meters per pixel or so at, at its nice. best, uh, aerial one kilometer per pixel or so. And the other moons, Umbriol, Titania, and Oberon were all at several kilometers per pixel. So okay. we, don't, we don't show them here. They are still very interesting, but um, we have the best images of Miranda and Ariel, and they do seem to be particularly interesting. Nice. So this really motivated us. What's going on in the Uranian system? Um, you know, the moons, they're, they're original, as we think, to, to Uranus, which is what makes it different uh, from Neptune, right? If we're comparing the two ice giants, yeah. Neptune uh, has Triton, which was a, which we think is a captured Kuiper Belt object. It came in, it disrupted the original moon system. All those other moons kind of got thrown out. So now there's just Triton, which is really interesting in its own right. But if we're thinking about you know, how does an ice giant system, an original ice giant system evolve? How can we compare this potentially to exoplanets, exoplanetary systems that we see in other um, in other areas in the solar system? Like we are not in the solar system, sorry, in the galaxy. Um, <laughs> you know, one of those. Uh, you know, how, um, how did this ice giant system form and evolve? How did its moons come to be as they are today? Um, and, and to answer that question, we really have to go to Uranus instead of Neptune. Um, so that's one of our main focuses of this mission. Um, and then we'll also talk about uh, how the moons and the rings sort of interact and then how the magnetosphere um, also uh, is particularly interesting in the Uranian system. So those are sort of our three mm -hmm. primary goals here. We have, um, you know, do the, sat do the Uranian satellites, are they ocean worlds? Do they, do they host subsurface oceans? We have found ocean, subsurface oceans in places in the outer solar system that we didn't expect to find them, again, in the Saturnian system. Um, can they exist in the Uranian system, too? This would definitely uh, advance our understanding of how oceans where and how oceans form and can exist, and whether then they could be potentially habitable or not. Cool. Very cool. Okay, so yeah, moving on. Um, that's really starting to dive into the science, right? Um, the other thing that makes uh, the Uranian system so interesting is is this dynamic magnetosphere, um, and it really fits into to look or to investigating the rings and the moons and the magnetosphere because we're talking about this system as a whole. Um, and so that next figure is is where we really start to see the connection between uh, the moons and the magnetosphere. And so here, this is a figure from uh, Peranicus and Chang, nineteen ninety. So it's a figure that not that we didn't reproduce ourselves, but that's well well cited in the literature. And what what we're seeing here is we're looking at electron on, electrons on the left, protons on the right. 
um, mm -hmm. as Voyager 2 flew through the system. And what they're highlighting here in those dashed bars are the um, the orbits of the satellites. So U would be Umbriel, A is Ariel, M is Miranda. And what you're seeing here are dips, dips in the electron count, dips in the proton count as yeah. you go through these areas where the moons are. And so what we see are, are that the energetic charged particle fluxes, they are interacting with the moon surfaces or with the moons themselves somehow. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's really interesting. That's not something that we see in the Saturnian system. We see these sorts of dips in the Saturnian system when we have neutral gases present. Um, and that's not something that we see in the Saturnian system. So what we're seeing, what we think we're seeing in the Iranian system uh, is really a lot of interaction between the magnetosphere, between the plasma and the moons themselves, um, whether that takes the form of weathering or something else. We really don't know. Got to go back. <laughs> Got to go back and figure it out. But we do see this correlation uh, between the moons and um, the magnetosphere. And so um, it really lends itself well for studying the moons. We need to be studying the magnetosphere as well to understand what's going on on the moons. Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of signatures, potential signatures of magnetosphere satellite interactions um, that could be uh, useful to understanding how the surfaces of the moons have evolved through time. Um, and this sort of leads us also into how the, the rings and the minor satellites might be affecting the surfaces of the moons too. And so we have there. Um, these really dark, dense, sharp-edged rings at Uranus. Again, very different from the Saturnian system where we have these really bright and broad, white, wide rings, if you will. Um, and we really don't understand how the how the Uranus, how the Uranian rings um, evolve over four billion years. They seem to be very chaotic. It doesn't really seem like they should um, survive for four billion years. So how we have these, these rings sort of uh, persist through time? Do they persist through time? Maybe they don't. Um, that's something really interesting about the rings. Although our uh, knowledge of ring systems would say if we have these dark rings, dark would imply that they're old. Mm -hmm. But if they're chaotic and dynamic, how can they be old? And so there's kind of this conundrum, this like mystery going on um, in the mm -hmm. Iranian rings. Um, and then also related to that, uh, we have a couple of really interesting rings. Um, uh, we have the Mu ring, which um, you want to, uh, well, no, we'll talk about yeah, that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Mu ring um, is really interesting because it's one, of, it's one of the few dusty rings that Uranus does have. Mm -hmm. And it has these really interesting properties um, that make it very similar to the Epsilon, uh, to the E-ring, sorry, at Saturn. So as we know, Saturn's E-ring is formed um, from the material that Enceladus is spewing. Um, out of itself pole. And so, and it has this really um, blue color is really, um, the grain sizes are, are all very similar and that's what gives it this blue color. And that's what we see in the Mu ring at Uranus too, except instead of having an Enceladus, uh, the Mu ring at Uranus has Mab. And Mab is this little small moon. It's I think about 10 kilometers or so in <laughs> diameter. It's literally tiny, tiny little moon. But how can this really tiny little moon be producing this ring? How is it interacting with this ring? Why does it look so similar to the E-ring at Saturn? Um, again, kind of a mystery. Um, if you scroll down a bit to figure three, I guess we're at now. Um, this is the one... This is of the few images of the rings that were taken by by the Voyager 2 spacecraft when it was in the system. And, and so on the right, you can see these really thin, dark rings. And then mm -hmm. um, on the left, we do have the one image that was taken in occultation and where you can see the dusty rings of Uranus. And again, if you compare these right next to the Saturn rings, these wouldn't, these would look very small. So they're, they're not... Um, they're not as as broad and dusty and uh, bright as the Saturnian rings, but we do have some dusty rings as well in the mm -hmm. Uranian system. But we don't have enough shepherd moons to actually keep the, the thin rings as they are. And so there's also this conundrum of how we keep the rings so, uh, so sharp and so um, narrow in the Uranian system. Mm -hmm. And then linking the, the rings to the moons, um, there's this open question of whether... Uh, some of the moons, like Miranda, for instance, could have actually come from the rings. 
um, whether it ah. kind of coalesced in the rings mm. and then migrated outwards, did Miranda form differently than the rest of the Uranian moons? Um, did it come from the rings? Uh, really, we see all three of these systems, the rings, the moons, and the magnetosphere really interacting from the few hints that we have. So um, we know that studying all three of them together would be really powerful. Yes, yes, very nice. All right. Um, so touching a little bit back on the magnetosphere before we move on, the magnetosphere of Uranus is just so crazy, right? It's, it has this, yeah, uh, Uranus is it's on its side, right? It's tilted over on its side, over 90 degrees. Um, but then the magnetosphere is offset from that another 57 degrees yes. so, or 59 degrees. Um, and uh, it's, so it's really just a crazy setup, right? And, and if we're thinking about how... Uh, the magnetosphere interacts with it, especially like the solar wind. Um, the solar wind is coming in and, and normally, right, if your magnetosphere is sort of um, perpendicular to that, if you will. Um, but here, well, that's not what we see. So if you scroll down to figure four, what we actually think could be happening um, because of how the solar wind and the magnetosphere are oriented towards each other, um, it gives an opportunity for the magnetosphere to actually um, open and close essentially to the solar wind. So we see on the left this closed orientation, but it, it as it, because it's sort of spinning and tumbling in this uh, strange geometry, it could actually be open to the solar wind at certain yeah. times. Right. And so that's something that's really interesting. Um, it could be letting either material escape from the magnetosphere of Uranus or letting in solar wind uh, right. from, from the outside. And so that's really interesting just from a magnetosphere dynamics perspective. Yeah. It's also really interesting um, in relation to Earth because we know when in the past when Earth's poles have been reverse, uh, reversing, it can be take on this strange multipolar geometry with respect to the solar wind and what really goes on during that time. I mean, we don't know. We've never observed it on Earth, never. but we can observe it at Uranus because it's doing that quite a bit almost all the time. Um, so yeah. it'd be really interesting to go there and even just to compare to, to Earth's history of what could be going on in the magnetosphere. Yeah, true. Good. Yeah. So we talked about these three sorts of systems and how they sort of interact and also how they're interesting in their own right. Um, you know, we haven't talked too much about the planet itself and, and we'll come back to the planet itself um, maybe towards the end. But okay. for now, we really wanted to keep this mission concept because it is, you know, um, we're capped at, you know, we capped at a billion dollars. We, you know, this is a concept. We're not building this mission, but in theory, it would be capped at a billion dollars. And so we really needed to keep the science focused, right? We need to keep the science focused on, on certain things. It's not that we don't love the planet. We love the planet. It's mysterious in its own way. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about, we can talk about some of the interesting things going on on the planet, but in order to keep, keep the mission tight and small, um, we have to focus on things. And so, so that's really what the point of this concept was, is to focus on the moons, magnetospheres, and rings because they interact so heavily. Um, they really lend each other, lend uh, each other well to a, a focused concept on the three of them. Cool. And so we came up with this instrument suite based on the science that we wanted to address of uh, just a camera, a visible infrared mapping spectrometer, a magnetometer, a plasma spectrometer, and potentially an energetic particle detector to study these, these three parts of the system. And if I remember right, a TRL is a technology readiness level or something? Yeah, technology readiness level, exactly. And so <laughs> what we're just showing here in table one is that all of all of the technology that we would need for this image or for this mission, sorry, this mission concept has been flown before. Mm -hmm. It's been flown before on outer solar system missions. We're not doing anything crazy. We're not doing anything um, particularly new on the technology side, but we would get so much new science. And Good. that just really just lowers the risk, right? We're just thinking Absolutely. about mm -hmm. the risk the outer solar mm -hmm. system. Yeah, because there's no rescue mission. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we can do all this amazing science with this instrument suite and, and that's what we have, uh, down in, in the next, uh, figure, figure table, if you will. <laughs> oh, very <laughs> and, nice. Um, yeah, all of the key questions that we would want to answer with this mission. And, and we've talked about these, uh, a little bit, but really the magnetosphere, um, the magnetospheric questions, they overlap with the moon's questions, the moon's questions overlap with the ring's questions, which is what we're showing here on the right. These uh -huh. three systems, again, are really interacting and, um, Cool. And that's why they lend themselves well to a, to a focused mission concept. Cool. 
Cool. So I yeah, like we start out in the magnetosphere with to what extent are the structure and dynamics of the Uranian system driven by solar wind versus internal processes? We kind of just talked about mm -hmm. that. Yeah. How, are, how are the major moons or are the major moons sources of magnetospheric plasma? Again, we talked about that interaction of the plasma between the, potentially the moon surfaces or the moon just feeding into the plasma. Um, yeah, great questions. Um, to what extent are the major moons weathered by magnetospheric particles? Again, that's potentially why we would see those dips in um, the electrons and protons. Uh -huh. Do any of the major moons have an exosphere? We really don't know. We haven't observed the moons uh, well enough to understand whether they have potentially an exosphere or really light atmosphere, right? Um, and if so, how would that interact with the magnetosphere? And the main reason to ask that question too is it would affect how we detect oceans on the on the Uranian moons. Right. So do the major moons have conducting subsurface oceans? Can we detect them through induction? Again, how does this affect moon magnetosphere interactions? Very nice. Very nice. And then personally, my favorites, right? Are any of the major moons currently geologically active? What are their geologic histories? Again, we see this really strange geologic history on Miranda. What's going on there? We see a lot of really unique features on Ariel. Uh, what's going on there? What are the relative ages of the moons? We really don't have a good um, you know, story for the impact rates in the Uranian system, but how even how are they um, how are the moons? Uh, relative to each other. Are they all 4 billion years old? Again, did Monanta potentially keep them the rings? Is it a little younger? Can we determine that? Yeah. Um, what are the internal structures of the major moons? Wow. Again, we're kind of relating back to oceans, kind of relating back to if there aren't oceans, why? You know, do we expect to see oceans? Are they frozen out? What are the internal structures of the of the major moons? Right. And to determine all this, we really need to understand what are the endogenic versus the exogenic processes. So what are the the, the um, processes that are coming from the moon within itself? Are the, geo the geology or the surface structures that we see, um, are those um, from endogenic thermal processes within the moon, or are they from exogenic weathering processes from the magnetosphere or from... Uh, we didn't talk about this as much, but there's also potentially ring rain from, or like rain of particles from the outer regular satellites. So there's ah. red outer regular satellites that might be raining all this like dust in on the, on the major moons. Is that why we see um, different color patterns on the uh, Uranian yeah, moon? Yeah. Similar to maybe what we see in the Saturnian system, is it not? Um, yeah. And then again, uh, what's going on with the Mu ring? Uh, why, why do we see this really small moon map uh, seems to be creating this this mu ring which is so similar to the e-ring at saturn um but it doesn't have enceladus um do the rings have the same composition as the nearby moons or moonlets and this might uh help us again determine whether um these little moons or moonlets are forming from the rings or not uh, what are the ring dynamics governing the Uranian rings? As we touched on in the beginning, we, you know, we really don't understand how these narrow, dark, dense rings can be maintained uh, over or over long periods, and, yeah. and especially without shepherding moons, um, yes. <clears throat> like we see in the Saturnian system. And yeah, what causes the structure of those narrow, dense rings? Are they self-sustaining? Mm -hmm. um, are they chaotic? Will they go away? Maybe they're maybe they're um, they actually have temporally short lives. Yeah. So. We just happen to be at a lucky place. At a lucky right. Time. Maybe we're in a lucky place in a lucky time. So this is really like uh, the the full nice. um, suite of questions that we would hope to answer with a mission like this. And you can see mm -hmm. how they're heavily related between the moon's magnetosphere and the rings. The mommy. Mm -hmm, mommy. And then, okay. yeah, over on the right, we have the instruments that we would use. And those are all the instruments that we listed before yeah. in, the, in the previous mm -hmm. table to answer yes. some of those questions. Yep, that was at the table one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing we didn't talk about too much was, um, I mean, I mentioned, you know, are there oceans in these moons? Um, if so, could we detect them? How would they interact with the magnetosphere? And so that's really what we show in the next figure um, was really just a proof of concept because at the time uh, when we were publishing this, no one had really shown before that you could detect oceans in the Uranian moons. Um, so this is just a figure from one of uh, the co our co-authors, Corey Cochran's 2021 papers that shows that you can detect um, oceans if they're present in, in the Uranian moons. And actually what helps you do that, right? So this is through induction, what we're looking at um, 
right. or the frequencies of the magnetosphere where you could potentially do an induction study. So, um, and over on the left, we had the magnetic field strength and kind of the cutoff that you're looking at is maybe around that 10 to the zero. Um, you were looking for frequencies that kind of rise above that 10 to the zero. And the reason I picked, mm -hmm. that's just my pick, right? I picked 10 to the zero because uh, that's one nanotesla that tends to be about the sensitivity of, of magnetometers that we send to the outer solar system. So you want it to be detectable above that limit, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. what we see, for instance, at, uh, or what we think we'll see at Europa, for instance, uh, with the Europa Clipper mission would be an induced magnetic field from the subsurface ocean on Europa of, you know, a couple nanotesla, several nanotesla or so. And so, yeah. well, actually these, these frequencies that we're seeing in the Uranian system are potentially a lot larger than that. Yeah. Um, and so they're potentially mm -hmm. very easily detectable by uh, a typical outer solar system magnetometer. Yeah. Um, and that's really because, again, the Uranian system has um, this magnetosphere, has this really complex geometry, has this really odd geometry, and that causes a lot of variation in the magnetic field at the moons, which would be really good if there is a conductive subsurface ocean, because right. that variation right. will produce a larger induction signal. <clears throat> right. So Uranus actually lends itself really well to doing induction studies to look for subsurface oceans at the Uranian moons. Nice. I mean, that's true, sorry, that's true particularly for Miranda, Ariel, and Umbriel. Titania, maybe Oberon is actually outside of the magnetosphere. Oberon, we think, actually sits yeah. in the solar wind. So that's not that great yeah. for that. <laughs> but um, there are other ways you can detect oceans, but it's really easy to do induction at, at uh, Miranda, Ariel, and Umbriel if they have conductive subsurface oceans. You'll probably see that signal. Mm -hmm. But more details on that, you can read Corey Cochran's 2021 paper. He did a great job analyzing all of that. Good shout out. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. And so really what we what we wanted to show here was that we can do a, a focused Uranus mission on a tight budget yep. and take away a lot of science from that. Um, a lot of science that would affect a lot of different scientific fields, um, covering the moons, the magnetosphere and the rings. It's a lot of different, very impactful science that relates also to other systems in our solar system. Again, contrasting again, what we think we know about the Saturnian system and mysteries that still remain in the Saturnian system. Can we take that and compare to Uranus and learn something even broader uh -huh. about our solar system? So that's really what we were going for here. And, um, you know, we did some rough cost estimates. Um, I guess that was like a year ago now uh, and uh, showed that we do have, you know, there is feasibility of this concept. It could potentially fit in the $1 billion cost cap um, mm -hmm. if, if Uranus or the Uranian system was added to the New Frontiers list. Um, so that's really what we were taking away um, from this concept. And really, I think what we wanted to advertise by publishing this is that it is possible. You can go, you can orbit Uranus for a billion dollars and you can get a lot of really great science out of that. And that's really um, what we wanted to show with this paper. So that is super awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Aaron, <laughs> thank you so much for walking us through this very lovely PSJ mission concept. Yeah. You know, and, and I'll just relate it to, you know, things that have been going on now, right? Um, of course, yeah. since this paper was published, the Planetary Science Decadal Survey, the new Planetary Science Decadal Survey came out and they actually recommended as their top priority, the Uranus Orbiter, Uranus Orbiter and Pro flagship, which is great. That's not something that we don't support. All we were trying to show with this paper, right, is that you could do a focused mission for cheaper, but you will get so much more science out of a flagship, right? You'll be able to include the planet. The planet has so many more mysteries as well. And I think now, right, we can move forward having um, well-defined um, the questions of, of the Uranian system. And that will hopefully feed into any future flagship concept that might come down the line. Yeah, that's absolutely great that that got the, um, one of the top recommendations. Yeah, yeah, it's very exciting. Very exciting for the community. Uh, Uranus. Very cool. Very cool. So I uh, certainly hope over the next, let's say, maybe two to five years, we'll be seeing some additional papers on, on uh, the Uranian system magnetospheres and mm -hmm. rings and all of that. And um, Yeah, definitely stay tuned. I'm working on a Miranda paper as well, too. And if the flagship was to launch, what sort of a timescale for that? 
you know, that's uh, not really something that's that's been announced. I think in the planetary decadal survey, they hoped for um, they hope for being able to take advantage of the Jupiter gravity assist that's available until about 2032, I believe. Um, Jupiter gravity assist lets you get more mass into the system for cheaper and have a shorter flight time. Um, but they also have additional opportunities after that if you can't take advantage of the Jupiter gravity assist. They lay that out in the in the decadal survey. So there are options I think that go out to almost almost every year um, through the 2030s. So depending on how NASA decides to proceed, then uh, hopefully we'll have options for launching a Uranus mission in the 2030s sometime. That would be so awesome. That'd be a yeah. lot of prep work getting ready for that. So yeah. This is part of that. Yeah. The exciting <laughs> thing about that is that we would want to we want to get back to Uranus, right? But in a different season. Um, than the Voyager 2 flyby. Because again, because Uranus has this like tilt over on its side, if we get back at the same time that Voyager 2 flew by, it was when the south poles of all the moons and the um, and Uranus itself was illuminated. So we'd like to go back at a different time when we could see maybe the North Pole or you know some other things uh, that would be in light. Um, so it is important to get back um, before, you know, 20 in the, we would like to get back in the 2040s, 2050s. Nice. Awesome. I look forward to seeing that. That's going to be Yeah, cool. it would be awesome. Very cool. All righty, Erin, thank you so much for walking us through your very lovely article. And that was yeah. it. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And uh, we'll see you on the next one, everyone. Bye. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you.